Thanks for everyone coming today. So for those of you who are joining us for the first time, Either is an artist-run platform focused on new media and photography. So we have monthly talks, having artists to share their practice and experience. When the last time our uh, team members talking about who's our favorite new photography artist, we all mentioned Lucas. So here we are. And Lucas Blaylock is a great photographer, artist. Uh, he's also a good teacher and educator to us. I think it's a very good opportunity to bring everyone together. And it's also our pleasure to introduce Lucas to our Chinese audience. And we're just all excited about this lecture. Now I would like to introduce some uh, backgrounds about Lucas. Uh, Lucas Blaylock is a photographer from North Carolina. And now he lives and works in Brooklyn, New York, but currently uh, he's in London. So his work challenges the limitations and contradiction uh, of photography. So basically it's about, I will say, uh, questioning, perfection and truth. And Lucas is interested in revealing the process behind the photographic images. He uses both traditional and digital techniques uh, to create the real image of ordinary things that he often get from dollar store. So instead of using Photoshop to refine and perfect the images, Lucas used overlapping techniques such as clone stamp and masking to bring these behind the things process to the center stage uh, show to the viewers and we'll have a q a session at the end of the lecture so if you have any questions just don't feel hesitant to ask during the q a session thank you so much annie thank you and uh, thank you leah for translating it's uh, this is going to be an adventure i think um, so I will say that I uh, for this talk i'm working on a new talk right now, so you all are getting my. Uh, like the first, the first go of a new, uh, a new way of thinking or a new way for me to talk about my work. So uh, I hope it goes smooth. So in kind of thinking about my work recently, for a long time, I've done a talk that really just kind of started uh, when I started with photography and kind of just moved forward chronologically. And I'm kind of trying to shift space right now and do a talk that talk more about kind of some of the themes going on in the work and some of the ways that the work is actually like stitched together, like the, the what makes the work's fabric. And I thought I would start with this idea of still life. Like I am a still life photographer if I am, uh, if I am anything. So what I want to say about photography is that for me, photography has been, has set up a relationship to the world that isn't enough, you know? So uh, I love photography. I studied photography as an undergraduate, but I've always felt that the photograph in its uh, lack of time and its, its flatness, uh, it doesn't, doesn't sort of engage our sensory beings very much. Um, and I, I felt like that was something that I could push against, you know, that this is something that I could, uh, that I could push back on, that I could um, make, that this was a problem in photography that I could work on and try to make uh, more space around. So this poverty I'm talking about, so this is, uh, if you Google uh, the word digital age, uh, this is, this is what you get. This is the image the internet gives you. So I feel like the photography that I'm talking about is, is, being not enough uh, is a photography specifically that comes uh, in this digital moment. So all of the work that I will show uh, comes from like 2009 and after. And it's really a time when, when photography was really changing. Like when I learned photography in the 90s, uh, in the early 2000s, uh, I was learning a, a, a printing, uh, like a, a way of capturing the world onto paper. Uh, and, and photography has obviously changed uh, a tremendous amount since, since then. So, uh, so we're talking about, uh, about this screen-based photography, and, and I think that's, a, that's an important element. So, you know, it's a photography that produced something like this. Um, it's a photography that produces versions uh, and multiplicity and um, like photography back in, uh, in, in its other moments, I think had this great metaphor for the human eye, you know, like to look at a photograph was to kind of look through someone else's vision, like to look through someone else's seeing. 
and when you look at an image like this, that's kind of not what we, that's, that's kind of not what photography has become. Photography has become like a, a huge sort of warehouse of, uh, of, of images uh, that we have access to. So this is a photography that is made uh, with a camera and a computer, right? So it's not to say that you can't make a, a straight image uh, that, that isn't manipulated, but that, that every uh, photograph that we expect photography at this point uh, to exist in a screen-based space. Um, and I think that that's important. So, so for me, uh, what I was kind of interested in doing was to, to take uh, this screen-based thing and these screen-based tools and try to draw them back out into a relationship with, uh, with, our, with our bodily selves, you know? So, so to take these things that are kind of only addressing us uh, cerebrally, you know, like kind of only addressing the mental uh, and trying to reconnect them to the nervous. So I pick still life. This is a Matisse still life uh, from the 30s. I pick still life because still life has got a special relationship to photography because in a still life photograph, uh, we really feel like we're looking at the object we're looking at. This is a picture by Jan Gruber. In a photograph of a, of a person, you don't necessarily have this sense. You actually really don't have this sense. Looking at a photograph of a person is nothing like looking at a person. But with, a, with an object, um, looking at a picture of an object is very much like looking at that object. Uh, this is a photograph by Dora Maar. And so what I really wanted in my work was this relationship. Like I wanted to take photography, which is this common language for picturing. And I wanted to take objects, which were also kind of very common and very everyday. And then I wanted to push them together uh, because these were things that we all knew. These were languages we all already spoke. Uh, and so I wanted to look for strangeness and for music in these, this set of already known uh, elements. So all I what I want to get at is that there are expectations for what a photograph should look like. And there are also expectations for how these objects should act. Uh, and so I'm, I'm using those expectations uh, as the basis for starting my pictures. And I can accentuate those expectations at times, or I can contradict them. I can also put something in the photograph that's not necessarily uh, what you expect is its subject. I can write a word, this one's called LOL, from like 2010, or try to make something that's not really there, you know, like uh, like this sweater, that's, that's not a sweater at all, it's a piece of wrapping paper. So I, I got to thinking about photography this way uh, as a set of expectations, as an exploration of the medium, uh, because I worked as an undergraduate with Stephen Shore. Uh, this is a Stephen Shore photograph from the 1970s. And Stephen talks about how his work, he wanted to explore the conditions of the medium. So like the potentials of being a photographer, the potentials of using large format photography for him. Uh, and he also at the same time wanted to explore the culture. And He's doing this in the 1970s, and the culture he's exploring is like road trip America, you know? Uh, and so for me, I feel like I'm also doing this. Uh, I'm also exploring the medium and exploring the culture, uh, but in a, in a different moment and in a different way. Okay, so um, this slide says, uh, repetition is the father of learning, which is a quote from the hip hop artist Lil Wayne, which he says really beautifully twice in a row in this documentary about him. And the idea here is that um, when I started out with uh, using Photoshop as a tool in my work, the only people using Photoshop were uh, professionals. It was either artists or it was uh, commercial photographers. And then by 2012 or 2013, uh, as social media had picked up and apps were becoming more and more of a thing, everyone was using post-production tools. And that was a big shift for me. It, it sort of... Uh, it went from letting me use this kind of professional studio idea as the backdrop for my work and making kind of like being badly behaved in this, this kind of way, you know, that uh, there were expectations and I was kind of upsetting those expectations where photography had come to accept a much broader set of uh, ideas, you know, that, that you could intervene, you could put a Snapchat filter on, you could uh, change the color of your image in Instagram, like, uh, all of these things started to really shift the way that I think everybody saw photography. And I feel very strongly that, that photography is a shared language. It's like, uh, it's like English, right? So, so English is, a, is, 
is a used language. It stays alive by being used. Uh, so is it, it changes as our use of it changes. And I think photography is the same. So I was thinking about photography as being, um, it's kind of not enough, right? Like it's, it's not enough, it's not, um, it, doesn't, it doesn't necessarily set up a, uh, a compelling or a, a enough of a relationship to the world. So I went about trying to build a language in my work uh, to uh, try to make up for that space. And so I started off doing that by sort of grounding my language in the history of photography. So, so I went and found pictures like this one. Uh, so this is a multigraph, uh, so kind of photograph made in the early 20th century and sold as a postcard. Um, and I went back and made my own version. And I started working through the history of photography this way a little bit. This is a picture by Ache. This is one by me. Uh, and just trying to think this language to try to ground my language against the language that already was there. To think about photography as conventional, uh, to think about it as um, like the way the way someone might think more about painting, you know, that, uh, that a thing had come before, someone had made a monochrome, so that gave you a new opportunity. So I thought about it that way, instead of just thinking about photography as the relationship between the camera, the photographer, and the subject. So this is Man Ray, Lee Miller. This is a picture I made. So early on, I was working this way. So this is uh, the last one was Outer Bridge, uh, another picture of eggs. Brancusi. And then I started to break away from, uh, from that kind of thinking so much uh, and started to, to think about the way that things going on in my own work uh, might start to develop a language. So I was using this kind of bad Photoshop brush tool, which has got a very um, hard edge and looks kind of silly. And it's kind of a bad, it's, ba it's a bad paintbrush, right? It felt a lot like a hot dog. So I saw this opportunity in the work once I'd made this uh, to think about making this. And then once I'd made this, I later on uh, was thinking about this 3D uh, tool that Photoshop also has. And, and this kind of 3D brush mark turned somewhat easily for me into this. And this has happened a number of times. Like this is a picture about holes. These are like, uh, like you look through a door, you know, they're like keyholes and they can kind of turn into these kinds of holes. And this is a picture of objects with holes that also has holes cut in it. Uh, and I'm cutting it with the eraser in Photoshop. And those kind of holes can become these kinds of holes. And again, with uh, something being kind of papered over or camouflaged, uh, this is a kind of like manual clone stamp. And this is me doing it in the computer. Whoops. And then this kind of erasure, you know, so I'm thinking about erasing a thing. This, this is ambiguous in Photoshop. Are you covering it over? Are you scrubbing it out? What is, what is going on? And this kind of thing turned into this, which is like more like redaction, but it's another kind of, uh, of erasing. And again, like you can watch that this, which is in this point, just like me blacking out the text in an image can turn into a, a line. Here it's the bottom of a shoe and that line can turn back into a hot dog and that hot dog can turn into a figure. So I, I think this kind of thing, I'm like making a language of likeness, you know, like these things are all like each other in ways. Uh, and I'm trying to set up a way for you as a viewer to navigate these pictures and to start to make these connections, not only in the pictures, but in the relationships in your world outside of these pictures. So the next idea I wanna introduce is the stand-in, uh, which I've mentioned a bit already. But the idea is that, that sometimes, again, thinking about expectations and photography, if you put the wrong thing or the wrong body into a role, uh, you get a, a new experience basically. And so this is a photograph of me when I was 21 years old uh, as Janet Lee in, in Psycho, like uh, the Alfred Hitchcock movie. And so I thought that this idea of taking on this role that wasn't a role that I might be expected to take on uh, had a certain kind of resonance, you know, it, it, it vibrated in a way that I was interested in. And so, um, you know, there's a whole like the avant-garde is a long tradition of this idea of interruption, you know, of, of putting the wrong thing somewhere like Duchamp in the urinal uh, is, uh, is about him replacing what should have been a sculpture with a piece of plumbing. And so I think that I've been really influenced by that. And I've been really influenced by, uh, by this. This fellow's name is Bertolt Brecht. And he's a, a playwright 
and a kind of theater theorist uh, from the first half of the 20th century. And he had a lot of ideas. The best way to make a kind of an active artwork was to not make it seamless, but to show the labor uh, that it took to make it. Uh, and I took very strongly from his ideas in thinking about my work. So this idea of the stand-in though, you know, like uh, in this situation, it's like, this is a picture called the guitar player. And uh, obviously he's holding like a, a putting green, like a cheap golf toy, uh, not a guitar, but it, it kind of like, uh, it does enough, you know, like the object uh, is enough to conjure, to conjure. Uh, uh, what it's saying. What it, even the hot dogs, I mean, these works were kind of like bad paintings, you know, it's like thinking about this kind of uh, laying on, uh, layering of brush strokes that comes in painting, uh, like abstract expressionist painting particularly, uh, and that I could kind of do this, do like a burlesque of this. And what I mean by burlesque, burlesque is a term usually associated with kind of like uh, sexy dancing, but it's, it's an overperformance of sexuality. It's a kind of like inflated uh, version of something that might be subtle otherwise. Um, and so I think I was kind of using a kind of burlesque of photography. So, or this one, a stand-in, this is a, a bunch of objects that have kind of become a dog. Uh, this is a picture called the house guest. Or this one is a mail room uh, in my studio building that I've turned into a, uh, a switchboard, uh, like for telephones. Or this one where I, I've, I've kind of like uh, done a not amazing job of giving this monkey back its body. Or this one, which is a picture of my mom uh, in Rome in an apartment she could have never been in when she was young. So it's called Young Mom in Rome. And I like this idea that, yeah, I can, I can kind of, with language, with visuality, put things in, like tell stories and put things in situations where, uh, where they, they weren't or haven't been, which felt like, you know, part of photography's limit was that uh, you could only tell the story that was in front of you. I've also done things where I made, like, may ask questions about what could stand in for what. So this picture is made in the computer almost fully with these photographic elements cut out of different pictures. You know, I was making pictures where I could, I was putting things on a table and then photographing them. And I was wondering if, if I switched the order around, you know, if I photograph them and then I put them in the computer and then I put them together. Like if I, if I did it backwards, would it still count? Like would it, could it still act like a photograph? Or this one where I was like, you know, what's the absolute wrong object to put in front of my camera? Or this one, which I think just stretches the boundaries of, uh, of what kind of manipulations a photograph can take before it starts to become something else. So this idea of the stand-in, basically I was talking about this language that I've been trying to make and so this idea of the stand-in, this idea of gags uh, are two ways that I'm like populating that language, you know? So, so I'm making a language and I'm needing to come up with new little terms in it, new ways to touch the world. Uh, and so these are just some of the ways that I'm going about that. But I get this idea of gags from Jean-Luc Godard. Uh, I read uh, a treatment of his early film, Woman is a Woman, uh, which is a great film. And I thought it was very funny. It was just two pages. And it was like the plot points, it's about, a, it's a story about a woman who wants to become pregnant and her boyfriend who doesn't really want a child. And it's about their kind of uh, dance around this thing. And so he writes out the things that need to happen in the movie. And between each one, he writes the word gags. And gags in Godard are like, uh, like this scene, which is from Band Apart, uh, which is another film uh, from around the same time where the movie will go forward for a little while and then something uh, kind of all by itself will happen. Like this is this beautiful dance sequence uh, in Woman is a Woman. At some point, the main character rides his bicycle in circles around his apartment. Just things start to happen. You start to realize that a lot of the pleasure he's giving you in the film is from things that aren't necessarily moving the story forward. And sometimes these gags are even political. You know, there'll be like a an aside about, about French colonialism. So it's, it's really an interesting way to think about like making a movie uh, or a string of things, a series, has all these interruptions that, uh, that lead to other, other kinds of thinking. Godard is actually how I got to Brecht. Uh, so he's been very important in my thinking. Um, as is this person, this is Buster Keaton. Uh, Buster Keaton's a silent film comic uh, who did Slapstick. Uh, you all probably know who he is, uh, but I love him because in some ways his, he, he did all these things. He had sets fall on him. He would like use his body to fall through and edit. He would do all these kind of funny things that in some ways showed 
uh, early cinema audiences about how film worked. You know, he was kind of teaching you while he was making you laugh. Uh, and I, I found that this idea really inspirational as well. There's a third here. This is a painting by the French painter surrealist Magritte in the 1940s. Magritte made paintings for one year that looked crazy uh, and not like nothing else he made. Uh, these are two more. Um, and he was trying to make the worst paintings he could figure out how to make. He was making them in spite for a dealer in Paris. Uh, and I love them. They're called period Vache, uh, V-A-C-H-E, which is like year of the cow. And I think that they're so strange uh, and amazing. And I love this idea that the thing you're doing, you know, being a painter, being a photographer, like that there's an other side, you know, we all think about, I think making the best version, but I think there's something extremely liberating about thinking about making the worst. Uh, this is a photograph of David Hammond selling snowballs in the winter in New York in the eighties. This is a photograph of an installation by Martin Kippenberger, German uh, sculptor, painter all around, who uh, made all these paintings and had them photographed and then destroyed them and threw them in a dumpster and then just exhibited the photographs of the paintings. This is a work by Mike Kelly, uh, thinking through kind of, I don't know, small town American uh, sort of uh, craft situation. Uh, this is a great work by Rachel Harrison, where she had uh, six different photo labs in New York print this picture of grass and they all came out really different. <laughs> and so she showed all of them together. Uh, this is a photograph by Vic Muniz, who I worked for for like four years. Uh, I was his studio assistant. This is a picture of wire. So he's, he's bent wire uh, to be this image of a monkey holding a camera. He's very invested in this idea of the gag uh, and the joke. And I, I think my time in his studio uh, probably influenced me quite a lot. So I, I want to say that, you know, humor works, these gags work because we have expectations and basically languages, these languages are social, you know, so, uh, so it's a social language. I think photography is also a social language. Uh, and so I can make, I can make games and jokes and plays and photography that connect to other photographs, to other realities, to other parts of the world. I'm speaking in a common language. I'm using common objects. But I'll say it again, like I'm using common objects and I'm, I'm using a common way of picturing uh, and I'm just kind of asking uh, this to act differently uh, for new things to happen there. So this is a picture called Double Recipe uh, where I made a photograph of some sausage and wanted some more sausage, so I made some more. You know, this is another kind of gag, this uh, thing photographed on a background that's, that's bad for it. Or these pictures and the way that they mirror each other, like thinking about the way pictures go together is also a way to, to think about, um, or this one feels almost like an advertisement with no, uh, with no name. It's a photograph I made of my face. So it's a self-portrait made of pipe cleaners. This one's kind of a, a game of, uh, of filling up the squares or looking at a bag of rubber bands or imagining the shape that, that this sort of armature uh, might support, making a G. And I think that with these goals, you know, you start to develop the goal and it starts to make the picture make a kind of sense. This is a picture called Another Shadow, which uh, is a photograph of an object with its shadow and then another shadow that's been made in Photoshop. So this is a daytime picture. This is a nighttime picture. And all that's changing is the, uh, the color of the window up on the right. This is a door that looks like a chocolate bar. This is a whole book of hot dogs. So on the book level, you can also make a gag, you know, you can, you can make a thing that doesn't reward expectations. Or this, which is a calendar uh, I made for 2020 back in like 2015. I had no idea that 2020 was gonna be the year that it was. Um, or this one. So after I made all the hot dog pictures, I made this picture and showed it in a show and it's called the hot dogs go on vacation. So the next thing I wanna talk about is this idea of uh, cartoons and consequences. Um, which usually don't go together, you know? Usually things in cartoons, like if you think of, I don't know, like uh, Wile E. Coyote falling off the mountain, you know, he hits the ground and gets flattened, but then he gets back up. And so there's this idea in this, in a lot of fantasy space of, of there, being, there being bodies, but not being bodies that are ever in trouble. I think that uh, there's an intersection here for me between this kind of fantasy idea and this idea of bodies in trouble that has is, is been really structuring my work for the last few years. So when I was a kid, when I was 10 years old, I was at Disney World on the ride Pirates of the Caribbean. There was, a, there was an accident and the boats collided and it 
my thumb got amputated between the two boats. Uh, and so, you know, I was a small child, I was 10 years old. And so um, they rushed me to the hospital and they couldn't find the thumb and they didn't really know what to do. And so my parents were making phone calls and someone, a doctor suggested that uh, there was a new surgery where they could take your toe off of your foot and put it on your hand. This sounded like the best option. So that's what we did. Uh, I had the surgery when I was 10 and it was successful. And so the, the thumb on my right hand is my big toe uh, from my right foot. And, you know, I became this artist who used Photoshop and was constantly moving parts of things onto other, other you know, like uh, re relocating bits uh, to, make, uh, to make new kinds of holes. And I'd always thought that this was probably, um, part of the story, that this accident was part of who I was as an artist. But I think during the pandemic, uh, I started thinking, I was spent a lot of time on my own in my studio, and I started thinking about how it's the other parts of this story uh, that actually also were part of my work. You know, Disney is a certain kind of American sort of like optimistic space, right? That, uh, that, that optimism also had kind of created a world uh, that was unrealistic, that America often viewed itself in ways that weren't, weren't very consistent. You know, it, it didn't see its own problems. As a person growing up in, in that situation and with those problems, uh, you start to feel the difference there. And so I started thinking about how much this Disney story in this world of cartoons, in this world of fantasy, in this place where I got hurt, uh, actually were all really tied up in like my bigger project. So my work kind of has turned uh, and it's, it's really trying to take up these questions these days of really like, how can I get my pictures uh, to address or to, to speak to the kind of real conditions um, of my experience. And I think that that went from starting off in a place where I was working, making this burlesque of a studio, of a commercial photo studio, to a place where I was kind of exploring all of the sort of opportunities uh, and kind of imagining my work through painting and thinking about uh, making new kinds of photographs uh, to landing in this place where it's become obvious to me that a lot of the tools that I've been using since the beginning uh, were drawing me closer and closer to a place that's actually quite um, personal and quite uh, emotional. So I did a show uh, in New York last year uh, about this called Florida 1989. You know, of course, I didn't have photographs from Florida in 1989. So I kind of recreated uh, the sense of this world through, uh, the, through pictures I, I made recently. And so this is a kind of family portrait. Uh, this image is called Florida 1989. There are also pictures like this in the show. Uh, this is blep. You know, and it's this kind of cartoon character uh, who's it was a little overly physical. Like it's like a little, it's like too much of a body. You know, it's not it's not comfortably uh, cartoony. This one's called Kissing Booth. This was not in that show, but uh, is kind of getting to this like really corporeal, physical, sadder, stranger space. That you know, and this is something that I will say I'm still working on. Like I don't, you know, I was talking about Brecht and the photo studio, like these have been models in my work that have allowed me to talk about and, and have really structured the way that I've made it a lot of the time. And, and where I am now, it's much looser. I know, what the, I know what the big feelings in the work are, but I don't have a very strong model to say how it's being made. But this was also in that show. It's a painting by Philip Gustin. Uh, Gustin's been really important to me. His writings on being a painter, I found really inspirational a number of years ago. Um, graphic artist Chris Ware, uh, who's like a cartoonist, uh, talks about Gustin in a way that I really like, where he says that uh, Gustin's work is uh, does not look the way the modern world looks, but it looks the way the modern world feels. And I, I feel like there's something of that that I've been chasing in some of my recent work. And it's funny, I saw this picture beside this picture for the first time today, and I was like, oh, look at that. But, you know, this was also in the show, and this is a picture about amputation, you know, like... Uh, it's a picture called Reverse Titanic, Hell is in the Air. Uh, and Reverse Titanic is a reference to the James Cameron film. You know, the main characters are, are kissing on a boat uh, that they're about to die on. Uh, and this is a reverse Titanic because these two fish are making out after being dead uh, and already on the boat. Uh, and being in the waters is, is not their problem. Uh, this is a sculpture by Paul Feck. 
another person I've been thinking about a lot in the last couple of years. It's uh, another work of mine. So I think this idea of bodies, of like uh, of being embodied, of, you know, it's in some ways it's like, uh, it's a relationship to this question of photography in the screen and our lives in the screen uh, and looking for something that's more satisfying. But also something, you know, I think that in getting towards that more satisfying, there's also uh, a need to accept a body that's uh, that's that's not a screen image, uh, which I think is is really complicated for us. So uh, so yeah, we're just gonna kind of go. Uh, I think we're gonna just look for a little bit. So. I'm thinking about bodies. Uh, I'm thinking about presence in photographs. You know, like when you look at a photograph, you're almost always looking at something that's not there. You know, it's not a, it's an absence. And so how you get that absence to come back and be present uh, is, a, is a strange kind of like um, magic trick. But I am interested in this way that like in my work, uh, objects, you become very physical. They become very bodily. Like the world is almost like, full of life in a way. Uh, and at the same time, photographs of people can be very um, like mannequins, like kind of like objects. Uh, and so this exchange, this trade between these two terms is something I'm still working with uh, and thinking about a lot. But I feel like this idea of embodied space, like, a space that is full of energy and full of life, full of connective potential is, is really where my work has gone. This one's called The Occupants. So I, I, I wanted to, I made this picture of this hotel room in Switzerland. I, I was thinking about the way that digital forms in this flexible digital space now can occupy the material space in photographs. And so I wanted to make a kind of allegory about that. I wanted to make a picture that showed that. I thought that picture, um, related kind of to this picture. So this is a ghost photograph from the early 20th century, a spiritualist photograph. Um, and I thought it was that, thought that true because in this picture, you're looking at a virtual thing connecting or in the same space as a real thing. And in this space, you're also looking at a virtual thing in the same space as a material thing. And so that idea of the virtual and the material together is exciting to me. I'm thinking about it a lot. I think that we're all living in a space that's half virtual at this point and half material. So I'm very curious about this as like a place to make uh, make new pictures. This is another virtual and real. This is a fresco by Pontormo, which is in uh, it's in Florence. Uh, it's a very beautiful painting. If you're ever in Florence, definitely go out of your way to go see it. It's uh, extraordinary. But it's crazy because Christ's body here is the only thing that's physical. Everybody else is an angel. So you get this sense, even when you look at the painting of, of Christ's body being weighty and nothing else has any weight. It's really, a, really a strange, extraordinary thing. I'm gonna skip this for now. This is a sculpture by Frank Stella. And this is a sculpture by Reagan Moss, uh, who's a great sculptor uh, who I organized a show. I organized a show of her work in New York a few years ago that really impacted my thinking very deeply. Back to me. This was a show of really bizarre self-portraits, thinking about the body as my own body, thinking about inflation, like, you know, photography flattens the world. What would it be like to give those, those things bodies back, you know? So, so uh, like returning the body. This is a, an inflated shadow. So yeah, so I've been thinking most of this thinking in photography forever, like the, I've accepted the flat plane. You know, I've accepted that photography has limits and I've made photographs that are very heterogeneous, but I've, I've really kind of let everything be a photograph for the most part. And in the last year or two, that started to change. And I've made some things that are, use photography, use photography as a material, uh, use photography as part of what they're doing, but, uh, but are starting to expand in their object to some. Photography for me, at this point, really is a digital thing. So to make a print at all is to bring it into a world that's kind of foreign to it. It doesn't have the same feeling to me to use that limit, you know, to, to decide that I can only make a print. So if I'm already going to use this, do this thing that's foreign to photography, like I might as well keep going. Uh, and I, I'm just starting to explore that. This is a work uh, called Pantaloon One. 
uh, which is uh, athletic resistance bands uh, in dye sublimation print. And it, it's framed in the final version. This is a picture I took in my studio. We're gonna skip John Coltrane for now. But this, uh, this is from 2016. Uh, these works uh, stood on poles in the middle of the room or kind of in the middle of the room off the wall. Uh, this is from 2019. Uh, these are these huge, like four meter tall, five meter tall uh, photographs put on stretchers that had a really strange kind of wonderful um, object hood. Uh, they, they really quit feeling like photographs at that scale. You can get the sense of the scale to see the doorways and the, the pictures in the back. Uh, this is the work I did uh, as a little show in Hawaii uh, during the pandemic, uh, which is like a really large print on fabric or even stuff like this. So this is the last show in New York. Those are those little guys uh, you saw sitting at the pool earlier. Uh, and across the room, there's the pool, you know? So uh, so just thinking about like the rooms I'm showing my pictures in as being kind of uh, environments. I, I've been thinking about artists like Paul McCarthy a lot. Uh, that's the third picture in that room. This is a picture for going over a doorway. This one is, uh, is like the one I showed earlier, uh, right near the beginning uh, that I made like very early on. Um, and I kind of returned to it actually after going through making some 3D and augmented reality work, which I didn't talk about at all. And it was kind of based on this, but then this kind of became this thing, uh, which is uh, one of the, the 3D works in my last show, uh, which is uh, something called Film Object Artist Head. Uh, and these are dye sublimation prints that have been bound together with book cloth um, and kind of work like a zoetrope, uh, like an early cinema, device where you like would spin it and get an animation. Uh, but this is a very odd, unsatisfying form of animation. Um, but I, there's something about their kind of sadness and uh, pathos that I, I, really, uh, I really connect to. And I, I'm, I'm working on making some more of these. But it's a, it's, a, it's a metal book basically that's been folded out on a, on a rotating, um, on a spinning, like mechanized uh, uh, product, uh, products like turntable base. Uh, I've also been making some masks. Yeah, these are these are a kind of artist edition I, I've just finished. They don't they don't come on these pedestals. <laughs> I've, been, I've been working on uh, display mechanisms. This is just my studio. Um, last thing I want to talk about is actually where these masks come from. Is this book that I just put out um, called Figures. Uh, and Figures is uh, a kind of, uh, it's a really unusual book uh, It brings together some self-portraits that I showed along with these photographs of numbers, uh, both of which feel recursive, like it feels like you've seen them before. The book is actually made with a randomizing algorithm, uh, so it's put together randomly. Uh, so there are things that repeat, things that come back up, and then also moments where you feel like you've seen something before that you haven't really, um, just the pictures have a kind of uh, closeness to each other. Uh, but it's made by Zolo Books. It's been a really fun project to work on. The masks are uh, the artist edition that goes along with this book, um, but they're also included in the book. But it uses this idea of figures. In English, means both numbers and people. Yeah, it kind of uses that as like a, a, a pin uh, to hook these two really different uh, bodies of work together. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, Lucas. Yeah, thank you so much for having me. And thank you everyone who came. Uh, I really, uh, it's great. I saw some familiar names in the, uh, yeah. in the Zoom and it's, uh, it's wonderful y'all came. Thank you so much. Thank you. And actually we, uh, we do have some questions in the chat. Okay. And I will just start from the first one and uh, from AC, ANC and, okay, I will just read it for you. So, hi, Lucas. Uh, when did you become a full-time artist? And before that, what did you do for a living? I'm a working artist who just graduated last year. Kind of curious all of those experiences. Thank you. Yeah, to totally. That's great. Um, it took a long time. Uh, I, I stopped having a day job in, I mean, I still teach, you know, so I still do, I still do other things. Uh, it's not like I'm a, I am a full-time artist, but I'm, uh, I'm, I'm always, uh, there are always other parts, but I, I quit having a full-time job in 2011. I guess I was like 33 or something. I was 10 years out of undergraduate. Um, it's when I went to graduate school. 
So before that, I worked for an artist. I worked for Vic Muniz. Uh, I did some art handling, worked in restaurants for a long time. I, I, was, I was kind of serious about making my work. I don't know, I was very protective of that. So I worked a lot of really crappy jobs, um, but, uh, but it worked out, I don't know. We, we got here eventually. <laughs> And uh, we have another question from Hong Yu. So hi, Lucas, uh, thanks for sharing. I'm really interested in your idea of stand-in and gags. I'm cu very curious about what's your opinion of having a sense of humor in new photography. Thanks. Yeah, um, yeah, thank you very much for the question. Um, my opinion about humor. Uh, I mean, I think that for me, uh, humor has been like a way that I, I really deal with the world. World. like it's like really a part of who I am you know it's like part of how I'm how I'm I think humor is amazing I think uh people can be uh nervous to use humor in art um and I think art can get you know also very punchline oriented and and not not like humor can sometimes be the enemy of the strange but I think that uh when humor stays good and weird I, I love it I and mean, it's a lot of my favorite art has a has a big dose of humor and I also would say that I think a lot of art that we think about as being serious because we learned it in art history, when you dig deeper, you find out a lot of that art has a lot of humor too. Um, and I think that that's something that was really, um, it gave me a lot of permission as I was making things was to find out that like going back and looking at 19th century painting, that there were all sorts of jokes and weirdness in that stuff um, that, that looked so serious to me when I first saw it. Yeah, and uh, we have another question from Jace Jason. Uh, the question is talking about the social media and the ram ramifications of photos as a medium. There was a show at the San Francisco Museum of Modern Art that had the central pre uh, premise that no longer is in this uh, disseminations of photograph subordinate to its production but a defining element in the photographic process. What are your thoughts on this? In particular, does, this, uh, does the consideration of how your photograph may be the, uh, disseminated influence they're making? Um, yeah, I, I mean, I, I think that, that I make things for the wall. Like, I mean, I, I kind of feel like my work has been thinking about taking things that are natively virtual and drawing them out into a space that's more material, you know, that, that relates more to the body. So I do think about it a lot. Uh, and I'm really interested in photography, that it can go at all these speeds, that it can be both a print or an object uh, and be at the slow speed of an object, or it can also be at like the hyper speed of Instagram. Um, that it can be both and not lose itself, you know, like a painting, if you see it online, it's a picture of a painting. A photograph, if you see it online, is itself. Uh, and I, I'm excited that we can speak in a language that can travel at all these speeds. Um, but I think that, you know, if a picture does well in the world, if it like uh, makes room for itself, then it's going to end up being disseminated in many ways. Uh, and I think that that's, that's part of uh, my thinking as a photographer. Thank you, Lucas. And I will, I think I will just uh, have three more questions for you. Okay. So uh, this question is from Gugu. Hi, I really like your work. I would like to ask how you express politics in your photography. And for this kind of expression, how is it different from other traditional ways like article? Yeah. Sure. Uh, so I think about politics in my work, like initially I felt like, you know, photography was making a perfect world uh, and I was interrupting it. So there was like a very basic politics to being active with Photoshop in the beginning. But now I feel like the politics are always are in the kind of textures of the work, you know, like it's about a bunch of choices that get made, the kinds of objects that get photographed, the kinds of stories that I want to tell. Or the politics are kind of embedded in the bigger project. And I think it's different than an article is because I don't think uh, I don't think photography is very good at telling stories or giving complex ideas. Like I, I think it it's better at making sounds, you know, so I'm just kind of making some sounds. Uh, and those sounds do have a politics. They certainly have a politics for me. It influences my making a lot, but but they can't describe, they can't do the thing that like Bertolt Brecht, 
who I mentioned says this famous thing about how the photograph of a factory doesn't tell you anything about the factory. Uh, and I, I think he's right. Thank you. And Tony's asking, um, hi, Lucas. Although you've accepted the work as being flat, the images themselves are very three dimensional. So there's a building up and the reducing of forms that you constantly do, which I think works well, but can get repeti uh, repetitive, I guess. So uh, is the medium really being pushed if it's remaining in the same form? Well, I mean, I think for me, it, it's, uh, I mean, I kind of showed things out of sequence. Uh, I think there is a progression that happens in the pictures that, that changes that form somewhat. But I think that uh, the last works I showed uh, that are more sculptural is, is me asking that same question. Uh, you know, like, where, where do I want to take it from here? And what, uh, yeah, what, the, what does the next group of work look like? Um, so I, 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 I hear that question. Um, and I, I don't know how to answer it beyond saying that, yes, it does. And, you know, it's kind of hard to know when you're in the middle of a project what constraints are really productive and which ones can like, you know, make the thing you're making like uh, shine brighter or be uh, more uh, exact uh, and which ones are actually kind of real constraints that you need to try to get away from. Thank you. And now we have the last question. Uh, Doris has one yes. question. Yes. Yeah. Hi, Lucas. So nice Hi. to meet you. Nice to uh, meet you. Yeah, I really love your work. So I think my question might sound a bit silly, so just bear with me. Right. Uh, it, it's it's really easy to get into a loop. Like, you know, you get, have you ever feel stuck, like making certain things, certain style, and how you kind of process the negative, like, kind of like negative feedback from other people sometimes, you know, because, you know, you, you can't always have, positive sure. feedbacks, right? Yeah, so that's my question. I think when my work is going well, uh, and is at its healthiest, I make a whole lot of stuff. So, and I think that there's a way in which if you really do, the more you make, the more bored you're gonna get with the things you've already done. Um, and so it kind of pushes you to find new ways. And I, I think that like, for me, if I feel like I'm repeating myself, the, the goal then becomes to uh, to make twice as much, basically. Um, and I, I think that the more I make, uh, the more I engage that kind of thing, the more um, I don't know, the more real diversity kind of ends up ends up in the work. Uh, but I also look for um, you know I'm always looking for models. I do a lot of reading. I do a lot of looking. I, I'm kind of constantly bringing stuff in. So uh, so that's also an important way for me to get out of a out of a hole. Thank uh, you. Well, thank you, Doris. Thank you, Doris, for your questions. And yeah, actually, uh, I will have one more question. It's okay. like wrapping up our lecture today. So uh, many, uh, actually many, I think many audience uh, here today, they're either students who are still in our school or just graduated from mm -hmm. our school. So they're just, just start their artist career. So do you have any suggestion for young artists? I think my two suggestions are to make way more than you think you should. <laughs> um, really make a lot. Um, I think all the successful artists, I know the thing that is most common amongst them is that they all are really uh, productive. If you put your ideas in things instead of just leaving them as ideas, you, they change. And that change actually gets you new places that you haven't imagined yet. And it's really important to make things. Uh, and the other thing I would say is be really patient. I, I, you know, when I got out of school the first time, it took me 10 years before I got, uh, a, I had a solo show. That can feel very exhausting. And I think it's hard, it gets harder. I mean, it's like, you know, you do something for a year and it doesn't pay off and you feel like, okay, cool, I can do it a while longer. But if you do something 10 years and it hasn't paid off, you start to question your sanity. So, uh, so I, I think it's just, uh, yeah, trying to be patient, be patient with yourself and, uh, and just stay with the work, I think. Mm -hmm. Thank you so much, Lucas. Yeah. Cheers. Thank you all. Thank you so much for inviting me. Thank you so much. Take Thank care. you so much. And also everyone who comes here and... Yeah, so it's pretty much everything for today's lecture.